Hello there. In this video, we will introduce space-time interval. It's a key concept at the very heart of special theory of relativity. Actually, most of the mathematical formulations in special relativity is built using space-time interval. But today, we will focus on how this concept came into being and establish the one crucial feature that gives it its name and fame, that is the invariance of the space-time interval as we move from one inertial frame to the other. At this point, if the word Lorentz transformation has surfaced in your mind, no, you cannot use Lorentz transformation relations to prove the invariance of space-time interval. You can of course demonstrate or verify the invariance, but that's no proof. Why is that? Let's find out. So we will begin with where the idea of space-time interval comes from. The idea or the seed lies within the second postulate of special relativity, which tells us that time is not absolute. It flows differently for different inertial observers. This I made a video about, link is in the i button. There we have established that an object's motion through space affects the flow of time it experiences. This motivates us to fuse space and time together and think of a single entity, space-time. I do not mean coupled with a hyphen, but as a single word without the hyphen. In yet another video, we have seen that a wholesome description of an object's or observer's motion is best captured in something called a space-time diagram. There, we have also introduced the idea of an event and its space-time coordinates and their notational convention that we will be using in this video. So please have a look. You will find the link of that video in the i button too. All the paths followed by photons emitted from an event point in space-time diagram constitute a forward light cone starting at that point and growing as the time moves ahead. Since every point in a space-time diagram is a potential event point, so you can draw a light cone anywhere in the space-time diagram, not necessarily from the origin of the coordinate system. In fact, there is nothing sacred about the origin in a space-time diagram. It's just that we have taken an event point in space-time and started our clock from there and we also measure the position vectors with respect to that point. This reference event is called the origin. Of course, our choice of this event point will be dictated by the convenience it can offer us to solve a specific problem easily. Anyway, coming back to the light cone, since only photons can move on a light cone, you may say any pair of event points on a light cone must be connected by a photon's world line. So let us consider one such pair of events P and Q. In our inertial reference from S1, P has space-time coordinates x e mu, where e signifies the emission of a photon, and q has coordinates x r mu, where r of course signifies its reception. How are the coordinate readings taken? Well, think of the inertial observers as CCTV cameras installed everywhere in space, each recording all events in its immediate vicinity with their corresponding timestamps. Where each of these cameras are located in space, is known to S1 from anywhere, so the spatial coordinate x e vector of the photon emission along with the time of emission x e 0, which is just c the light speed times the timestamp t e, is easily available. The same is true for the reception event as well, which has spatial location x r vector and the timestamp t r. The photon moving with constant speed c takes the time interval t r minus t e to travel between points p and q which are spatially separated by position vector x r minus x e. So we readily have c times the time interval t r minus t e equals length of the position vector x r minus x e. Since this will hold regardless of which direction in space the photon propagates, so we write it with a modular square instead. A relation like this holds among the space-time coordinates of any such pair of events connected by photon wall lines. We can obtain a useful entity from this relation if we choose to bring everything to the left. On the left, we then get a unique combination of temporal and spatial coordinate differences for a given pair of events, a combination that always vanishes if the pair is connected by light signal. For such a pair, this particular combination vanishes not just for observers in our S1 reference frame, but for observers across all inertial reference frames. For example, if you consider a second inertial frame S2, the observers there will assign a different set of space-time coordinate readings for the same pair of light emission reception events P and Q, let's say prime coordinates x prime e mu and x prime r mu. Since the speed of light is the same in S2 frame as well, that is just C, the components of the prime space-time coordinates 
are going to have the exact same relation and therefore we end up getting the exact same combination that vanishes. This keeps happening in all inertial frames and thus we have found a quantity that remains unaltered as we jump from one inertial reference frame to the next. Such quantities that remain the same in all inertial frames are called invariant quantities. They are usually very important in physics, so we tend to name them. This particular invariant object is called the space-time interval for obvious reasons. After all, it's made of spatial and temporal intervals. We also give it a symbol delta s squared. Delta here signifies that it is an interval or a difference and of course the letter s comes from the word segment. But if this space-time interval is always zero, as we have just talked about for photons world lines, then what good is it to us? We can neither add, subtract or multiply or divide by it. So what do we do with it? What we do is we relax its definition. We let off the condition of being connected by light signal and think of a random pair of events 1 and 2 instead of the p and q we talked about and for these 1 and 2 write the same combination of temporal and spatial coordinate intervals. Then the space-time interval between these two events 1 and 2 is a non-zero quantity in general. On a side note, observe that even though these two events 1 and 2 are not connected by light signal but the temporal component t2 minus t1 still gets multiplied by the light speed c because this is the way the space-time interval is defined. In fact, the space-time interval is nothing but the standard Pythagorean definition of length squared with the only modification that the space and time components come with opposite signs. This difference is a sign that reminds us that although we put the time and space together, the spatial and time dimensions are not actually equivalent. How can they be? After all, we can go back and forth in space but not in time. Anyway, but wait, if these two events are in general not connected by light, the corresponding space-time interval may well be non-zero, but does this not take away the invariant status it had? After all, the song and dance we made about space-time interval started with the understanding that it will remain the same in all inertial frames, that is, it will be an invariant and that was only assured for intervals between events connected by light, because it would vanish in all frames due to the constancy of the speed of light in all frames. Surprisingly, the invariance of space-time interval holds for such arbitrary pair of events as well, that is, they will be non-zero and yet invariant. But to show this, we must reorient ourselves a bit and rewrite the definition of space-time interval for a pair of events that are very very close to each other, so much so that it becomes an infinitesimally small or infinitesimal quantity. So we take the space-time coordinates of event 1 and 2 as x mu and x mu plus dx mu. The difference dx mu in the coordinates are called differentials. They signify infinitesimal changes in the components that is dx0 or c dt and dxi or the components of dx vector. Rewriting the definition is now easy. All we need to do is to replace all the finite spatial and temporal coordinate differences in the definition by their corresponding coordinate differentials. The space-time interval itself is written as ds squared now instead of the delta s squared to indicate that it's an infinitesimal quantity. Now I know, I know this, this feels like window dressing but it is crucial because with this, we get access to a bag full of magic tricks called calculus. It lets us do stuff that is only justifiable if we are dealing with extremely small objects aka infinitesimals. And we are going to witness the wonders calculus can do for infinitesimally small space-time intervals. First note that the same events 1 and 2 will appear to have different sets of space-time coordinates, say primed ones for observers in S2 frame. We already know that space-time coordinates in different reference frames can be expressed as functions of each other, that is, they are connected by transformation equations. So, ds prime squared, the interval in S2 frame, must be a function of ds squared, the one in S1 frame. We need to find the form of this function. We do this using logic and calculus. Think of ds prime squared written as a combination of all powers of ds squared with different weights. So, it starts with alpha a constant plus beta another constant times ds squared to the power 1 plus gamma yet another constant times ds squared raised to the power 2 and so on. Our job is to find these constant weights like alpha, beta, gamma etc. The idea behind this kind of a series expansion is that as we include more and more terms the expression on the right increasingly resembles the value of ds prime squared. 
but we are dealing with the expression of an infinitesimal quantity on the right hand side here. So we do not need to go beyond the first significant power of d squared. Therefore, we start with alpha and stop at beta and do not need to look any further. See how dealing with infinitesimal saves us the workload. That's the magic of calculus. We now have a generic expression of d s prime squared on the right and we want to determine just two constants alpha and beta. Now the coolest thing about a constant is that if we can find its value in one special case, we are done. The same value works in all cases. So we consider that one special situation where we know exactly how the two space-time intervals ds and ds prime are related. This is when the events 1 and 2 are connected by light signals like the pq event points. In that case, we know that both the space-time intervals are zero and thus they are just equal to each other. So in this special case, our generic relation can only hold if alpha is zero. This settles alpha and makes the two space-time intervals just proportional to each other with a constant proportionality factor beta. We now have only this beta to fix. To fix beta, we need to think what are the relevant quantities it can depend on. So time, space and velocity are the only options here. I mean, these are the only physical quantities that are there in our theory so far. Now we expect things to be the same in Kolkata and London today and tomorrow, at least in physics. So space-time coordinate dependence is ruled out. Besides, being a constant, beta cannot depend on the space or time coordinate. The only possible quantity that should determine beta is the constant relative velocity between the two inertial frames S1 and S2. Further, we do not expect the direction of the relative velocity to come into the picture here because space-time interval is a scalar and should look the same irrespective of which direction we are looking at or looking from. So, only the magnitude of the relative velocity can affect beta, not its direction. To get any further, we need to bring in a third reference frame, let's say S3. I know it's getting a little bit messy, but bear with me for a second and things will clear up in a bit. Between the same pair of events 1 and 2, we now have the three space-time intervals corresponding to the three inertial frames S1, S2 and S3. ds squared for S1, ds prime squared for S2 and ds double prime squared for S3. These will be proportional to each other and the proportionality factor beta in each case will depend on the magnitude of the relative velocity among specific pair of frames. Therefore, we get three relations, two by expressing ds primed and ds double primed in terms of ds and one expressing ds double primed in terms of ds prime. Notice the relative velocity of S2 frame with respect to S1 is now written as v21, that of S3 with respect to S1 is written as v31 and so on. In the last relation, we can go one more step by expressing ds prime squared on the right hand side in terms of ds squared. Now we have two expressions for ds double prime squared, both in terms of ds squared. All we have to do is compare to get an equation connecting the three betas for the three relative velocities among the three frames. Now this is an impossible relation. It is impossible because it is trying to express the magnitude of v31 in terms of the magnitudes v32 and v21. However, we know that relative velocities between any two frames depend heavily on the direction of the velocities of this frame. So, such a relation can only hold if beta is not a function even of the magnitude of velocity and is just a pure constant. Okay, what can be the value of this constant? Easy enough. Notice dropping the velocity dependence totally, what we have got here is beta squared equal to beta. So only beta equal to 1 can satisfy this. This means the space-time intervals between the two events 1 and 2 measured in S1, S2 and S3 frames are simply equal to each other. So we may as well drop the primes and say that between two events there exists a unique space-time interval and when measured in different inertial frames its value remains the same. It is an invariant quantity. Even when these two events are not connected by a light signal, the same thing holds. Before we wind up, let me draw your attention to a few points. First. Both the spatial and temporal parts of the space-time interval differ from one another in different inertial frames. Only their combination as a space-time interval remains invariant. So, ds squared is same as ds prime squared, but neither dt is same as dt prime nor dx vector is same as dx prime vector. Second, though the invariance is established using infinitesimally small interval, but the invariance holds for finite space-time intervals as well. You just have to think of the total interval as a sum of many infinitesimal parts. 
Every piece is an invariant with respect to the two inertial frames under consideration. Third, note how we have used calculus to our benefit here. Because we were considering only infinitesimal intervals, we had only to determine two constants, alpha and beta. For a finite interval, there would have been many more constants as we could not have stopped merely at the second term while expressing ds prime squared as an expansion in ds squared. So many constants cannot be determined of course. Lastly, let's clarify that bit I mentioned about Lorentz transformations in the intro. Though we have not yet covered Lorentz transformation in this video or in any earlier video I posted on relativity, but you must have heard of it. These are a set of equations that express x mu prime of s2 as functions of x mu of s1 or vice versa. Now, if you are given these equations, then you can readily use them to write say dt prime and dx vector prime in terms of dt and dx vector. So just by substitution, it is very easy to check that ds prime squared is indeed identical to ds squared. This is what is usually asked for in the exams and it takes only a few trivial algebraic steps to do the job. But you should understand that in doing this, you are merely verifying, not proving the invariance of space-time interval and there is a subtle difference between the two. You see, the Lorentz transformation relations are obtained using the invariance of space-time interval in the first place. So obviously, they cannot be used to prove the invariance. Cross-checking is of course fine. With that said, let's stop for today and in future videos, we will see how to arrive at Lorentz transformation relations using the invariance of space-time intervals. So stay tuned. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.